about anaphylaxis, which is a very common um, emergency medical condition that we see in the emergency department and how to diagnose and treat it. All right, Natasha, the stage is all yours. All right, thank you, Michelle, so much. So uh, good morning to those of us who are listening to me from the USA and good afternoon to the listeners from Europe. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. Uh, you said pretty much everything uh, that needs to be said before I start with uh, my presentation. Uh, so uh, we can move on to the first slide and just let me give you a short introduction on the topic of anaphylaxis. So uh, anyway, before I start the lecture, I just want to uh, you know, let you know uh, I am not a professor or a teaching assistant. I am a recently graduated medical doctor currently working as a uh, general practitioner. So what I will speak about will mostly be about my experience with anaphylaxis and the way we treat anaphylaxis in primary care. And uh, I would also like to uh, give you a comparison between the way we treat anaphylaxis here in North Macedonia and the way that anaphylaxis is treated in the USA. And uh, most of the information I used in this uh, presentation is from the American Association of Family Practitioners. Uh, I can drop the links from the, uh, 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 from the information that I found most uh, useful when preparing the presentation, if you're interested in. And the statistics is mostly from there. Okay, so uh, let's get started. I am not a huge fan of definitions, I must say, but we need to, you know, at least uh, define the condition before we start uh, speaking about treatment uh, and uh, uh, managing of this kind of situations. It's a very severe, very dramatic uh, allergic reaction. Uh, basically, there, this is the most dramatic and life-threatening of all uh, types of uh, hypersensitivity. You know, there's four types of hypersensitivity, and this one is uh, mediated by immunoglobulin E, and it is the most dramatic. Uh, anaphylaxis usually happens uh, within f uh, five to 30 minutes after uh, the exposure to the antigen, which is very uh, rapid. And uh, uh, wait, let me just... Uh, if, if it's not treated immediately, if it's not recognized, it can be uh, fatal. Uh, wait, let me just start my video. Just a second. Uh, so I cannot see my video, but can you see me? Um, it looks like just an orange screen right now, <laughs> but... Eh, we tried technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm not sure. We had this problem with one of our people yesterday too. So uh, here it says that you can see my video. Uh, wait, let me just see if I can stop it and start it again. Okay. Uh, can you see me now? No. <laughs> Why? Uh, I don't know. This is the problem. Is we had this with the uh, yesterday on one of our lecturers, and they had to uninstall Zoom and reinstall. It was a mess. So it's okay. We'll just see orange, which is fine. <laughs> uh, You're doing great. So you can me, just continue. Okay. Let me just see if I can. Uh, change the source of the webcam. I, I see like four sources here. Okay. Maybe can. Hmm. There we go. Hey, it worked. Ah, you can see me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, as I started uh, explaining the introduction about anaphylaxis, so it can be very serious, very dramatic, uh, a reaction to an allergen uh, that can potentially be fatal if it's not uh, treated promptly and uh, adequate. And it usually happens very uh, unanticipated, uh, triggered by a common allergen. And if it's not uh, recognized right away, and if it's not 
treat it. I will speak later about the way we treat anaphylaxis uh, once it happens. Uh, uh, it can definitely lead to uh, death by either airway obstruction or vascular collapse or both. Uh, usually uh, this happens uh, when uh, immunoglobulin E is uh, triggered to produce uh, 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 wait, let me see. Uh, to produce histamine and to activate the mast cells and the basophil uh, cells uh, and it gives us a plethora of uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, these symptoms can range from der dermatologic, which are the most common. They appear in more than 90% of uh, anaphylactic cases, but also respiratory and cardiovascular are very common and uh, very life-threatening, as well as gastrointestinal and neurologic symptoms. So uh, can we please change the slide? Okay, so first let's see uh, which triggers can potentially uh, cause anaphylaxis. Uh, most commons are uh, food allergens uh, uh, that usually do not pose a threat to uh, the majority of the people, but for some people, uh, their allergy to nuts, eggs, milk, milk products, uh, fish, shellfish, soy, but also some food additives that there's no way for you to identify if they're in a food or not, uh, they can produce very dramatic uh, food uh, uh, allergic reactions. Uh, I think one of the most common uh, anaphylaxis, anaphylactic reaction is the one to peanut butter. And uh, uh, another uh, very common, especially during the summer months, is uh, the allergic reaction to uh, venomous insect stings, such as bees, wasps, yellow jacket, fire ants, uh, also, uh, when you're at the sea or on the beach, uh, je jellyfish stings can cause uh, an anaphylactic reaction. Also, the use of some medications can also trigger a potentially life-threatening anaphylactic reaction. Uh, one of the most common uh, triggers for anaphylactic in medicine used to be penicillin, especially back in the days. Nowadays, it's either not so common or it's already recognized and it's easier for people to avoid being treated with penicillin products. Another potentially uh, very dangerous medicine that can cause anaphylaxis is, penicil is uh, anesthetics, uh, which is why before uh, undergoing an elective procedure, uh, patients are usually uh, referred to an allergologist to perform uh, skin tests to determine whether you're allergic to some kind of anesthetic and if it's safe for you to uh, be given this anesthetic when undergoing surgery. Another uh, common cause is non-steroid and anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, one of the most common is uh, aspirin, but also uh, many others like Ketoprofen can cause uh, severe uh, reactions. Uh, also, opioids, tramadol, for example, can cause very severe anaphylaxis. I've witnessed it once and it was very dramatic. Also, blood pressure medications such as angiotensin in convertis uh, inhibitors, they can cause very dramatic. And also, I'm, I'm technically not sure if radio contrast media should be uh, considered a medication. It's more like... Uh, a medium you use to uh, uh, to uh, wait, to do a screening, uh, for example, uh, computer tomography. Uh, but uh, if it's not an emergency procedure, you should be performing uh, an allergy test to a certain contrast media to allow uh, to uh, evaluate if it's safe for you to use this uh, medium in uh, the uh, examination. Also, uh, latex is a very common professional anti-gene, especially uh, in us doctors, because it's so widespread. Uh, you can find latex not only in gloves, which are the most common, but also in catheters and many other disposable products that we use on a daily basis. Uh, another common anti-gene is animal dander uh, from pets, from birds, and uh, other animals that uh, you, you may encounter. Uh, another uh, thing that's 
uh, not really common is anaphylaxis caused by physical factors such as extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, sunlight, uh, but this is very, very rare. I will uh, say that once again. And another, uh, another thing I would like to mention here is that uh, idiopathic anaphylaxis is usually uh, is what we call when we cannot uh, certainly define the, the trigger that caused the uh, reaction. Although it is here in the last place, uh, it is expected that at least two thirds of the anaphylaxis cases are caused by an antigen that we cannot define. Okay, next slide. So now that we know what can usually trigger anaphylaxis, it is very important for you to know how to recognize anaphylaxis and uh, to be able to treat it suitably right away. So once you witness anaphylactic reaction, I can guarantee you that you won't be able to forget it. Uh, but it's very important for you to know the symptoms in order to uh, differentiate it from other uh, equally life-threatening uh, conditions. So uh, as, as I started, uh, symptoms usually start very shortly after exposition to the antigen. And the clinical history here is, most the, is the most important tool. Uh, why? Because uh, this is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, yes, there are some lab examinations that you may perform in order to confirm the diagnosis, but uh, they are not widely available, especially not if you're working in rural conditions like I am and you don't simply get access to them. So uh, if normally if this happens in a hospital, then yes, you may draw blood to evaluate some uh, parameters such as histamine or tryptase levels. But once again, those examinations are not very widespread, even if they are, they can be very expensive. So they are not normally performed, as, at least not here where I work. Another thing that you could uh, do in order to recognize or diagnose anaphylaxis uh, and prevent further uh, occurrence is uh, in vitro uh, testing of specific antigens or doing skin patch tests. But those tests are not really reliable as they can determine uh, the reaction of the organism to a certain antigen, but they cannot be uh, trusted to evaluate if this uh, if the organism will be so reactive to the antigen that it will go into full-blown anaphylaxis. So how to recognize? As I said, there are sim the symptoms uh, affect basically every part of the body because this is a systemic uh, response. Uh, but the most common and almost always present symptoms are uh, angioedema, uh, swelling of the of face, especially uh, the area around the eyes, uh, injected conjunctiva, which means you get basically very red eyes and tears may be flowing freely. Uh, you can notice swelling of the tongue, of the lips, which will make it very difficult for your patient to speak and to recreate what happened, what led to the uh, anaphylactic uh, reaction. And uh, you can get a, a urticary uh, rash uh, all over the body. Uh, which may uh, also may be very itchy for the patient. You may notice some flushing, uh, rash, uh, pillow erection, which is basically the elevation of the uh, of the hair all over the body, and angioedema, as I already said. So I would like to I would like you to look at these pictures and. Uh, try to memorize them, and in case, in case you uh, encounter such patients with such presentation, you need to think that there is something uh, anaphylact, uh, something uh, in in the form of anaphylactic reaction or anaphylactoid reaction, which uh, present themselves with very similar symptoms. And the general uh, thing that's common for all of them is uh, swelling and redness and itching. Uh, and rashes all over the body. So the respiratory symptoms uh, accompany more than 70% uh, of anaphylactic reaction. After the dermatologic, these are the most common symptoms. Uh, we can uh, separate these symptoms into lower and upper airway. 
when it comes to the upper airway, uh, people feeling feel like there's something uh, you know choking on them. Uh, they may be coughing, but uh, it's going to be a dry cough because there's nothing to uh, cough out. Uh, they may have trouble breathing, trouble speaking, trouble uh, uh, trouble ex uh, explaining uh, what happened, uh, even stridor. Uh, their face might be blue from uh, the swelling. And uh, eventually, uh, if the reaction is so... Uh, severe, it may, la may lead to respiratory collapse or uh, respiratory arrest. And when it comes to the lower airway symptoms, these are almost usually uh, followed by bronchospasm. So the stricture of the lower uh, airway, uh, wheezing or dry coughing, uh, feeling of chest tightness, uh, very, very uh, speed breathing, uh, risk, uh, decrease of the air expiratory flow, uh, and uh, once again, they can lead to a respiratory collapse if not treated right away. So another thing that I didn't mention uh, was uh, this, uh, other than uh, dermatologic and respiratory symptoms. Uh, the next most common uh, symptoms are gastroenterological symptoms, which uh, are usually presented with nausea uh, and uh, vomiting. Uh, Neurological symptoms, uh, they may mimic uh, seizure, uh, also uh, headaches or uh, pain throughout the body. Uh, so it's a very uh, severe reaction that requires immediate treatment. So once we defined what a typical anaphylactic reaction looks like, uh, we need to now discuss what we can differentiate it from. Uh, another uh, so the most important thing that you should uh, differentiate an anaphylaxis from is other types of shock, uh, septic, cardiogenic, or hypovolemic shock. Uh, other most common uh, thing that's confused with uh, anaphylaxis is a vasovagal event. But the main difference between anaphylaxis and uh, this is that in vasovagal event, due to the effect of the vagus nerve, you get bradyca bradycardia. And uh, in anaphylaxis, you get a very severe tachycardia that might even uh, go into a ter arterial uh, atrial fibrillation or flutter. So another thing that's very important for you to uh, differentiate it from is foreign body aspiration, especially in children. And uh, there is uh, the most important uh, thing you need to know is uh, anamnesis from whoever witnessed the event. You know, uh, if, if there was someone else present when such thing happened, uh, they will tell you like he was eating candy, beans, nuts or whatever, and then suddenly he started choking, then you might need to consider uh, foreign body aspiration as well as anaphylaxis. Uh, acute poisoning with a variety of uh, toxins can also mimic the clinical picture of uh, anaphylaxis, as well as hypoglycemia when people are. But the main difference between anaphylaxis and hypoglycemia is the color of the skin. In hypoglycemia, people usually go pale, uh, they start uh, sweating. Uh, and uh, in anaphylaxis, the skin is usually very warm and very red. Uh, seizure, I already mentioned that uh, although anaphylaxis gives some neuro neurological symptoms, you need to differentiate them from uh, an actual seizure, like for example in epilepsy. And other very rare symptoms that you normally do not witness on a daily basis are mastocytosis, panic attacks, very common especially nowadays, carcinoid tumors that can mimic uh, an anaphylactic reaction and so on. So uh, once we define what anaphylaxis looks like, uh, I would like to move on to the treatment of uh, acute anaphylaxis. And uh, in anesthesiology and in emergency medicine, you usually hear about the three important ABCs, which is airway, breathing, and circulation. So uh, in order to secure the airway and to make sure that the patient is uh, able to breathe on his own without uh, suffocating himself, you uh, might need to be in, to insert a uh, oropharyngeal airway device uh, in the in the oral cavity and uh, 
if this happens in hospital condition, you might be you, you might even need to uh, intubate the patient in order to secure the airway if the breathing of the patient is so compromised that uh, he's, he won't be able to be breathe, to breathe on his own. Uh, another thing uh, is monitoring and supporting breathing. Uh, if possible, uh, you need to be able to provide the patient with 100% oxygen, uh, which is doable if you're in uh, a doctor's office or in a hospital. But uh, if this happens in uh, you know domestic conditions or somewhere outdoors, then this wouldn't really be uh, at your disposal. And last but not least is to maintain the circulation and the normal blood pressure. Uh, when such levels of histamine are uh, released into the circulation, what happens is that uh, the blood vessels uh, dilate very uh, quickly, and this causes a huge blood, a huge uh, drop in blood pressure. So, what you need to do is to administer epinephrine, which is a vasoconstrictor, in order to be able to, you know, shrink those blood vessels and uh, uh, ele elevate the, the blood pressure. And how you maintain the circulation is you insert uh, two large bore IV catheters as fast as you can because as blood pressure drops significantly, then you won't. Then you, later you might not be able to find a good vein in order to uh, start an IV and correct the uh, hypovolemia. Uh, what you can do is uh, you can start an saline, uh, saline infusion, or even better, if you have crystalloids at your disposal then uh, you might uh, administer those as well. And the patient needs to be placed in supine position, uh, which means uh, that uh, the uh, legs uh, will be a bit elevated, and that's in order to increase the venous return to the heart, uh, to increase the cardiac output, uh, which will uh, help improve vital organ perfusion by reducing the perfusion of uh, the periphery limbs. So this is the position that you will need to place the patient in. Uh, you can see that the head is lying a bit lower and the feet are elevated. If this happens uh, somewhere outdoor, you might help the patient by uh, placing some uh, objects under the feet in order to uh, increase the, vas the cardiac output and uh, to increase the venous return to the heart. used worldwide in successful anaphylaxis treatment is epinephrine. There's really not much philosophy about it. Uh, what I read so much about when preparing this lecture was uh, about commercial epinephrine auto-injectors. Uh, these are very common, I think, in the United States, but I would like to correct someone. If, uh, so I would like someone to correct me if I'm wrong. So these are uh, preferred and normally used uh, throughout the USA. That's from uh, the American Association of Family Physicians. And it's really interesting because uh, although their use is very uh, simple and even the patient himself can give, him, uh, can give himself a shot uh, when uh, anaphylaxis starts, uh, these are not uh, really uh, available where I live and work with, work in. So uh, we use the good old fashioned way of diluting epinephrine. Uh, either way, the dose um, the, and the, the, the level of dilution is the same. It's more about the convenience and the speed of uh, administering epinephrine. So the dilution uh, for uh, adults is usually uh, one part of epinephrine to a thousand parts of uh, water for eye injections. And uh, in children, this dilution is even uh, is bigger. One part of epinephrine per 10,000 parts of uh, water for injections in children. Uh, what uh, sub, uh, the, the way of administering is subcutaneously in uh, children. No, uh, sorry. Uh, it is uh, injected subcutaneously, usually by the patient himself, if he has uh, such commercial auto-injector at his disposal. Uh, and uh, in hospitals, in primary care praxis, we usually inject it intramuscularly and uh, give the place of the shot a good massage in order for it to enter the circulation uh, faster. 
And uh, if, no, go back, thank you. Uh, if uh, you don't uh, see a good reaction from the first shot, then you are allowed to repeat the shot uh, two or three more times uh, at 10 to 15 minute intervals. And uh, if you're in hospital conditions, then you might be uh, able to uh, give uh, a continuous IV uh, infusion uh, with uh, adrenaline. Uh, with in, which would be uh, adequately uh, del delayed, of course. Uh, and uh, in this case, but this is like, as I said, this is not uh, normally done as it requires extensive cardiac monitoring because adrenaline, although it is a life-saving drug, it can also cause a very serious arrhythmia. It can cause heart ischemia. So you need to be very careful when you administer it. So uh, why is epinephrine uh, so uh, important and why is it irreplaceable when you treat uh, anaphylaxis? It uh, causes the activation of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors as well as beta-1, beta-2 uh, adrenergic receptors and uh, activating those receptors leads to an immediate vasoconstriction. Uh, it increases the peripheral vascular resistance, uh, which uh, causes to drop, uh, which causes a drop in the mucosal and skin edema. Uh, it stimulates the heart work, the work of the heart by increasing uh, the frequency of the heartbeats and increasing the uh, pumping power of the heart. Uh, also, when it comes to its effects on the lungs, it causes bronchodilatation and uh, it reverses the uh, airway obstruction, which allows for a better flow of the air and uh, reverses the vascular collapse. And so while adrenaline is the number one medicine, it's, it's irreplaceable. It's not the only thing that we give to patients that experience anaphylaxis. Another thing, another medications that are commonly used are uh, histamine receptor antagonists. There are two types of histamine receptors, H1 and H2, and there are drugs that can target either one of these receptors or both of them. Uh, you uh, normally when treating anaphylaxis, you should be able to block both of those uh, receptors. Of course, if you have such drug uh, at your disposal. And uh, I, uh, from what I read uh, in USA, the standard practice is to administer diphenhydramine, also better known as Benadryl or other uh, brand names, because it is a non-selective blocker. So it blocks both. Uh, histamine H1 and H2 receptors. Uh, another uh, medications that are used uh, can be ranitidine, uh, simetidine, uh, and uh, one uh, medication that we use uh, very often in our everyday practice here in North Macedonia is uh, the medication called chloroperamine or better known as sinopen because uh, it provides very quick relief of symptoms uh, once uh, the epinephrine shows the effect. Uh, and it normally it causes the patient to uh, regain its consciousness very uh, quicker and to, to make the patient feel a lot better. And uh, one serious side effect that you need to consider antihistamine is sedation. And you don't want your patient to be sedated after uh, experiencing anaphylaxis. Uh, another uh, class of medication that are uh, used in uh, treatment of uh, anaphylaxis is corticosteroids. Uh, there are so many of them available on the market. They are quite cheap and quite easy to administer, but they take, uh, they take more time to react. They take between six and 12 hours to show their full effect. Uh, but we still give them. Why? Because it uh, prevents the reoccurrence of uh, anaphylaxis and it prevents uh, it shortens the time of uh, anaphylaxis that happened, uh, that has already happened. Another uh, class of medications that you can uh, administer to patients with uh, anaphylaxis are uh, bronchodilatators. Uh, in the USA, the most common one is albuterol, and here we mostly use salbutamol. Uh, or you can give aminophilin IV, whereas albuterol and salbutamol, you give them uh, nebulized for the patients to breathe them in. And these are uh, especially useful when the patients 
are uh, wheezing or when the uh, respiratory stress uh, still persists after administering all previous classes of uh, therapy. And after the initial episode, once you have evaluated the patient to be stable and ready to go home, uh, you do not uh, discharge them without any medication for them to take home. Usually they are given a, a course of oral antihistamines uh, to take them for at least a month to prevent uh, future reoccurrence. And uh, you may also, uh, but that's not the standard norm, you may also uh, prescribe them some oral corticosteroids. So uh, once you see how dramatic anaphylaxis is, you will, you're going to want to do everything in your power to prevent anaphylaxis from reoccurring again. And uh, there's so many things uh, that you can do to educate your patients on uh, preventing uh, anaphylaxis to happen. But if it happens somewhere uh, uh, in conditions when it's out of your control and there's not much you can do to help them, it's very helpful for the patients to have uh, one of these devices, a preloaded uh, pen of uh, diluted uh, epinephrine for them to carry wherever they go, especially if uh, there is not a hospital or not a possibility for them to call ambulance and just take them to a doctor right away, is those, this kind of devices. So uh, you, if this is your patient that you're in charge of, you will need to be edu uh, educate them on how to use such uh, preloaded pens and where to give the shot and where and when to give the shot. Uh, so it's very important to educate the patient that if they start experiencing symptoms of anaphylaxis, it's not going to be enough for them to just give themselves a shot and go on with their day because the the main point of using such devices is to buy yourself some time until you can get proper medical attention uh, they are not a substitute for calling 911 or not a substitute for visiting the closest doctor's office office they simply uh, prevent uh, more dramatic symptoms to appear or a, a cardiovascular vascular collapse to occur and in the waiting time as you were waiting for the, uh, for the doctor's attention. So the key point is to educate the patient on how to avoid uh, exposure to uh, potential allergens. If there's food allergy, if this, if this is a food allergy that we're talking about, you need to uh, educate the patient that some sometimes uh, small amounts of uh, this uh, potential allergen can be found in some unsuspecting uh, uh, forms of uh, meals or uh, snacks or uh, all other, other kinds. So uh, it's very important to know where, where can you be exposed to such allergens and to avoid them at all costs. Uh, also, if, for example, we're talking about allergy to uh, venomous insects, uh, if if uh, patients are going somewhere uh, outdoors where there is potential to be bitten by such insects, you need to be able to they need to be able to give themselves a shot of uh, preloaded epinephrine, uh, pre uh, preferably in the place uh, where uh, the, the bite from the patient from the insect happened, uh, in order to. Uh, uh, <laughs> to constrict the, the blood vessels and to slow down the absorption of the antigen into the circulation. And after, no, go back, go back. After your patient has successfully uh, re uh, recovered from an episode of anaphylaxis, uh, they should uh, be referred to a specialist in allergology uh, in order to identify other potential triggers from the same group of antigenes. Uh, it is very important for an allergologist to, edu to further educate the patient. And uh, if there's possible for certain antigenes, uh, there are now some options, although many of them, of them are still in research, uh, to at least try some uh, desensitization and uh, provide pretreatment when it's possible and when it's indicated. All right, thank you so much. And